be honest with us, Roger. How many rolls of toilet paper are you down to? <laughs> well, how are you doing, Roger? We were just chatting about the coronavirus. How have you found this last week in Dublin? Yeah, it's it's interesting. Um, yeah, welcome to the Jeremy and Roger show, everyone. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> actually, funnily enough, um, there was almost 200 uh, cases in Ireland, and um, we got the impression that um, there was a lot of coverage just um, the day before, yeah, no, just yesterday, that's right, uh, about um, people kind of breaking the rules already. You know, for example, pubs are closed in Ireland, but they were found to be leaving the back door open so people could get in and that kind of stuff. Um, but then there was this 200 cases in the last 24 hours. I don't, I don't know how many today. And I noticed that um, the atmosphere around Dublin now is really somber and people are kind of avoiding each other. Um, you know, people, even in supermarkets, they're, they're not allowing people in until somebody comes out. So, you know, one person comes out and they allow another one in. So there's a big queue outside supermarkets um, and also pharmacists. So, yeah, I think people are, I think it's finally sinking in that we've got a real problem here now. Yeah, and just that gradual waking up process. And we're, uh, um, I guess the other thing that um, uh, is around the, the, how everyone's dealing with differently and how some people are taking this quite seriously, both for themselves and more importantly for others. And um, some are just kind of saying, you know, the, the old taglines, you know, it's um, just as many people die from the flu and, you know, yeah. I'm not going to be at risk. So why would I, you know, self-isolate and all these things? And to me, I think that draws quite an interesting analogy with um, uh, veganism and animal rights because, you know, it's, it's taking that um, a step further and not just thinking about our own needs, but also other people's needs and interests. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting, I mean, these kind of things are an interesting kind of challenge to neoliberalism and all the me, me, me kind of uh, generation. Um, because, uh, I mean, it's been said, hasn't it, that uh, the, the, the solution to this kind of problem are kind of socialist in nature, in the sense that you need to be looking after each other and caring and, you know, giving. And then on the other hand, you've got all the panic buying and stuff. And so there's a real kind of tension but, you know, fundamentally, from a sociological point of view, they're actually saying to social animals, stay away from each other. That's very difficult. So even if we start by taking everything serious, and I, and I think this is why the British government were reluctant to do things like um, closing the schools, for example. They've only done that partially, whereas in Ireland, you know, they've done it fully, right? But, mm -hmm. I mean, they've even done things like they've closed, um, you know, play parks, you know, kind of playgrounds. Uh, in Ireland, they're, they're all locked up and chained up. But the real fear is that uh, we're social animals and we're not going to be able to keep this up for very long. And so, you know, it's going to it's going to start to slip and slide because, you know, we need to be together as a species. We're actually we're actually um, being asked to go against our nature. You know, interesting, interesting challenge that is. Yeah, because I think um... I think we've seen similar numbers that that current estimates are what maybe 10 to 14 weeks that mm. this thing could be at its kind of peak. And then I guess I, I guess no one really knows, though. It'll just be kind of a week by week assessment. So, yeah, talking about the panic bite, uh, uh, panic buying, um, be honest with this, Roger. How many rolls of toilet paper are you down to? Precious. <laughs> I've, um, I think I've got about seven, but the, the weird thing was I, I bought one of those massive kind of um, 25 rolls thing um, <laughs> a couple of months ago, and I've, I've got about seven left, so I've not, I've not bought any uh, uh, in the last two months, so, so no, no, nobody can ever go me about the toilet rolls anyway. <laughs> I, I won't ask you again in a week. I will just leave it there and leave, leave it to the imagination. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, and I think uh, it's interesting because I think, um, uh, you know, talking about, like, you know, human ingenuity, I think times like this kind of challenge us to take a step back and say, OK, we're in this situation. This is our reality. What can we do with it? And as animal advocates, you know, how we can continue our advocacy. And then also just as, as good human beings, and obviously animal advocacy extends to that, too. Um, helping support our local communities. Have you seen any of that happening in Dublin as far as people um, supporting those that are maybe more vulnerable or perhaps interacting more um, virtually like we are now to kind of help 
almost build the community, even though we can't necessarily give each other a pat on the back? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I have. And um, the first thing to say about that, though, again, sociologically, is the fact that we've got a structural problem, which is capitalism. You know, I mean, you know, that's why they need to keep everybody working and stuff. And that, in fact, um, is the very reason why Britain's got a partial schools closed down because they want the key workers to carry on working. No, no point in them being at home, you know, w watching their kids kind of thing. At the same time, there are people kind of putting um, le letters through uh, people's um, letterboxes, you know, leaflets saying, you know, if you need shopping and stuff, bring this number. And of course, this is where it seems that social media re really coming into it. You know, I know um, a lot of people are uh, doing something which seems a bit interesting and obviously from an animal rights point of view is interesting but um, also very crucial which is offering a dog walking service for people who are self-isolating you know i have a friend who's doing that yeah something that all the all the vegan groups could think about but also i mean we're associated with food not bombs in in, in dublin and the organizer was saying you know we we need to think what, what what's happening with the with the homeless you know although you don't you're not you're not seeing them on the street uh, like we used to, but then again, we've not been on the street like like we used to be for a, a good well, you know eight or nine days now. So it's all still very much in the in the mix. It's early days, I guess. I mean, do you think it's just gonna? You, hopefully, um, you know, people can um, help support them anyway, um, and kind of all, almost breaking that social isolation in a way by doing so. Yeah, well, there are. I mean, like um, you know, on our midweek. Um, events we we do um four to seven and the reason for those strange hours is that uh, we have to wait for a museum to shut at four and then the feeding the homeless people arrive at seven so um we kind of had to vacate the spot in in order for that but that gives us those three hours but the point is i imagine the um you know I, it's actually got a title i don't like it, it said Fe feeding our homeless they've got written on their on their van which i, I don't like the idea of our homeless but there you go um but so uh, from a possessive perspective, yeah, it's, well, it's a bit paternalistic and all that, you know. I mean, it's a little bit like the Hunt Saboteurs thing and the League. I never liked, uh, you know, uh, hands off our, our wildlife. You know, it's not our wildlife. You know, the the wildlife, the free living beings belong to themselves. You know, we, you know, we we shouldn't claim ownership in that sense. But anyway, that's just a that's just a kind of like my niggle, I suppose. But uh, I think those these people are probably adapting to the to the situation because. They've they've obviously got to organise and get people together, in order to, uh, you know, because normally they would they would have maybe 20 people serving the food. Well, they're probably not even allowed to do that now, all in one group. So, but they might still be providing some kind of service, but having to adapt it, you know. And I think that's the thing that hopefully comes out through all this, because if nothing else, we're kind of forced to break our daily routines. Um, potentially have more free time on our hands. So it gives us the opportunity to hopefully think outside of ourselves. Um, real quickly, how do you feel about, um, alternatively to the term homeless, how do you feel about the term, um, I know we said we we're going to talk about language more in a future um, Roger and Jeremy episode, but just a little bit of it, it always comes up. How do you feel about the term um, homeless versus home free? Do you feel like it's almost a bit kind of too, um, uh, yeah, positive, putting too much of a positive spin on it, or do you think it's um, empowering or just a bit too far down the path of analyzing language, maybe? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. That That's one that I haven't really thought of, to be honest. I, I'll, I'll have to think about it and, and get back to you. Also, by the way, it's going to be Jeremy and Roger. We'll have to go alphabetically. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Maybe we could alternate each episode. Yeah. I'm not sure that'll be very good from a branding perspective if we change the name every week, but... No, and of course it is all about branding, folks, so that's very important in our movement, branding. Yeah, you know, well, not that's, that's necessarily not knowing sure. about philosophy or anything, but branding is the key, folks. That's what you got to do. Yeah, well, and, and, and for those who, because my plan is to edit this and um, uh, then share it on YouTube, and hopefully we can, down the line, maybe, maybe we'll uh, able to do some live ones so people can chuck us questions. Um, mm. But yeah, if any watching this and they'd like us to talk about something, I mean, I, I feel very, um, uh, for lack of a better term, privileged to be able to have these chats with you. And I mean, you've, you've been at this game for um, several multiples of the time frame that I have, so your breadth of experience and knowledge is... I think I'm only beginning to truly Jeremy, appreciate. You're, you're, you're just calling me old now, aren't you? That's, that's great. 
<laughs> well, I guess you can spin it both ways, can't you? Yes, I think you can. Actually, also the technology allows you to um, to play short film clips and stuff, doesn't it? As well. So if if we've got that and the audience involved, this this could be a really interesting series, and it looks like we've got a few weeks to develop it. So, you know, we we might end up with a fan base. Yeah, if we can give it a try. Well, and, yeah. and that's something I think, in addition to us, I think there's so many people out there that um, talk about um, veganism or more specifically animal rights in their day-to-day -day lives, which if they have experience doing that, I see no reason why more of us couldn't start doing Facebook Lives and just reaching out and, you know, maybe it doesn't, it's not about animal rights, but maybe it is, but just kind of almost reaching and pulling that community back that we might feel a bit distant from now and maybe mm -hmm. offering some support and dealing with some of these tough issues like the home free or the homeless like we were talking earlier and, and others. Yeah, but, we, but we, it's very important that we keep the Jeremy and Roger brand though and maybe franchise it. And so um, I'm, I'm going to start the Patreon thing and order the first Leah Jets. So uh, that's, <laughs> that's I'll, I'll, I'll get started on t-shirt designs. Yeah, yeah. And well, I've got a badge making machine, so we're, we're okay there. <laughs> <laughs> One other topic that I think that would be um, useful to explore um, before we wrap things up is um, I think there's been some pretty convincing um, connections between this starting at a facility that uses animals and um, I believe even kills them on site and whether that could have contributed um, to the, the cause of this virus in the first place. And I'm sure both of us and a lot of the people listening to this have seen the memes and the um, things calling out that, you know, um, if we were all vegan, maybe this wouldn't have happened and almost kind of starting to um, uh, draw that connection. And I guess the question is, should we um, be raising these um, uh, re uh, relationships or should we, um, wait, let the dust settle, and then maybe um, reflect on it. And can it be done strategically? Yeah, this is this is a fascinating one, really. It's it's almost like um, how do we handle this tactically in a way, um, rather than just simply, as it were, telling the truth? Because there does seem to be fairly firm evidence that um, we're talking about this particular virus and previous ones uh, had um, origins in the use of other animals. So. Uh, I mean, there is an Australian documentary, which I actually posted a few days ago, which um, makes a claim directly that it was the wet markets in, in China. So um, that, in, that, in a sense, is a problem because it will invite racist comments. And in terms of um, trying to get people to think um, about that connection, first of all, this might not be a good time. Uh, to do that kind of optics. I think that's the kind of uh, point that uh, Jake Conroy has made recently. Um, at the same time, you know, we, we do have the right to kind of point it out. It's just that we have to think carefully about the audience and, you know, not to get too technical, but, um, you know, in, in a particular discipline in sociology, they talk about recipient design. You know, you, you have to design your um, talk and your claims with the recipients in mind, especially if you're wanting to educate them. You know, you, you're, not, you're not trying to hit them on the head with it. You're trying to educate them ultimately. So we do have to think kind of carefully about that because we do seem to have a, like a strong case to say, well, actually, don't you think this um, this is an issue here, right? Um, I, I don't see the mass media uh, doing that, although I do think um, I do think The Guardian might have covered something recently, but I, I don't see radio and TV doing that. I don't know whether you do from your English perspective, uh, Jeremy, but I, I don't see it here anyway. Oh, I, I, I uh, swerve um, the TV as much as possible, I think. Uh, <laughs> I, yeah, I, me too. I, I get just, most I just of my information from the internet and YouTube, to be honest. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and the, the other thing I think that I know, especially early on in my advocacy, I became uh, acutely aware of and tried to start to move away from is trying to avoid shaming people, um, which I think there could be a little element of that in some of these memes, which I appreciate meme creation is an art in and of itself. However, mm -hmm. if we say, you did this, you deserved it because this caused it, versus kind of um, saying, hey, what about this connection? Can we work towards finding solutions together? And you know, that's more abstract than practical, I appreciate, but I don't know if that's something that we can move more towards to move us more into that strategic bucket versus maybe that 
all of those vegans, you know, again, type bucket. Uh, well, you know, that raises lots of interesting questions there, because we're going to talk about graphic uh, imagery and stuff uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a future uh, version of whatever we're calling this. And um, but also, you know, claims making is quite difficult in, in that sense. And, um, you know, even if you try and be very diplomatic and you try to kind of go easy, as it, as it were, you know, the people who want to be offended will find a way to be offended. So there is always a balance that you can't you can't just, um, you know, there's always this saying about, you know, you, you've got to meet the people where they are. But that means we'll be meeting them in McDonald's. You know, so we can't do that. You know, mm -hmm. you, you know you've got you've got a kind of like. Uh, you know, put your flag in the sand at some point and go, I, I'm not going any further than this now. You know, I've, I've, I've made this concession. I, I've said this. I've tried to be diplomatic about the language. I've tried to do, you know, X, Y, and Z. But, you know, ultimately, the, the truth has got to be said. So that, again, is another kind of tactical kind of issue, which is live at the moment in the movement. You know, there are some people who are trying to use, you know, exaggerated or kind of um, confrontational language kind of on purpose, almost to kind of wind people up. Um, whereas that's not really the way to educate um, in a traditional sense. I mean, I don't really know whether it would work in that sense, you know, kind of um, get on the wrong side of people and that educates them. I'm not quite sure if that's a model that, that would work. Um, it, it seems to be counterproductive as well. So I, I, I'm not know. It'd be an interesting um, future episode though, wouldn't it? Well, I was just thinking, I think we have about a half dozen of them um, teed up. So, yeah, if there's any of the topics that our listeners want to um, hear first, it sounds like we've talked about uh, language, graphic videos. Another one I think that would be really interesting to explore would be um, intersectionality and especially the perceptions both within and outside of the movement. That, mm -hmm. I, that might be a tricky one to stay under that 1020 mark on, but we can try. Um, well, the most important would be how to contribute to our Patreon page, which doesn't exist, actually. But, uh... <laughs> Well, well, we'll see about that. We'll see about that. <laughs> but probably the biggest question it sounds like from tonight is what we're going to call this thing. So, so if anyone oh, has yeah. any ideas, we've yeah. got a, a seasoned vet. And uh, I mean, I've been, been at this a few years. I don't know what, what um, kind of descriptors I could attach to my, attach this, but um, well, when, when, when I was good saying... discussion. Yeah, I opened, I opened a cinema in 1975 in a place called Kirby near Liverpool, and I'd left um, Labrooks and started working for a company called J&A. So we could call it J&R, maybe. Yeah. Mm. I, I don't know. I, <laughs> I I like that RJ, though. We're going to we're gonna have to have a poll or something. RJ yes. versus JR. Uh, yeah, <laughs> we've got, we got to flick, flick, it, flick a coin or something. I'll try and find a, du a double-headed one so I, I can win. <laughs> That sounds good. Oh, I'll really appreciate your time, Roger, and um, be in touch, and um, we'll have to connect here again soon. Yes, and folks, you know, uh, I hope you like this format. We, we think we can make it a go, and we'll, we'll obviously try and cover some, some important issues, and so I um, hope you keep tuning in. So uh, thanks a lot, Jeremy, and see you soon.